Good morning and welcome to another Tech Tuesday with Brody Precision. I am Frank Whitmer and today's topic is on CBUS integration with webs, specifically the new um, CBUS gateway called the Cliff-CBUS LC. Basically what we're talking about is existing XL5000 um, systems. Whether it's systems out there with XPS as a front end or symmetry or EBI, which is the branch channel, um, we're all using the legacy XL5000 devices. Turn that off. So <clears throat> what we have is systems where you have CBUS that is a metallic pair RS485, it could be LAN based, uh, CBUS over LAN. And in some cases, sites have a billing network adapter, a BNA, which um, was bringing in the CBUS and then over IP into the symmetry or EBI or whatever the, the front end was. And then also um, there's sites without the BNA, which will be bought, brought directly into a 485 port. Um, and so what we're talking about is bringing in the XL 500s, 600s, 100s, 50s, uh, those type of devices. And Honeywell has come out with, and it was with uh, uh, Centraline was the, I guess the ones who developed it, um, was a driver called the HONCR, or that's a typo, it should be DR. Um, Honeywell um, driver CBUS that is used with either a BNA adapter or with a cliff device. And it can be used with the legacy CBUS over 45 and also CBUS over LAN. And that was one of the issues we've had all along with, with integrating with CBUS was if it was a, a LAN system, then we weren't able to bring it in directly into a JACE. Um, so with this setup, we're able to do that. Uh, so just as an overview, this is the cliff device. And those of you that know the Cypher 50, it's basically the same housing uh, style and size of a uh, Cypher 50 controller. Um, it has two RS-45 ports on it, only the first port is used for the C bus. And we'll get into the different connections as we go along. Um, so this, the cliff device is a gateway for bringing in the XL5000 devices. And as I said, with physical 485 or virtual CBUS over LAN. And this device will talk over the network, over IP to the Cypher 50, or it can actually be used in conjunction with the WEBS JACE or a WEBS supervisor as well as an enterprise driver. Um, and then there is firmware available to get the Cliff device to the right level to work with with the uh, XL5000. Uh, the base price of this Cliff of Cliff device is roughly $2,700. Um, along with that, the Honeywell CBUS driver is required. That's the HONDR CBUS. Um, one of the things that's nice is this driver is included with the Cyper 50 controller. So there's no cost for this driver for the uh, uh, for the Cyper 50. If you want to use it with a Web 8000 or with a supervisor, the list price for that driver is $6,500. So as you can see, there's a huge price difference between whether you want to bring it into an 8000 or just bring it into a Cyper 50. Um, I've included some prices here for the uh, the Cyper 50 with no display is under $1,900. You get that driver for nothing, so all you're paying for is the cliff device, the, the gateway. So it's uh, so if you have even if you have an existing 8,000, it's more cost effective to purchase a Cyper 50 with the um, the cliff device rather than having to you buy this uh, this driver for your your uh, Web 8,000. Uh, so this Honeywell CBUS driver uh, is used with the uh, cliff device and also it can be used with the BNA. So if you have an existing XL5000 system and you're using BNAs to bring in your network to the existing front end, you could redeploy this BNA and bring it directly into a, um, a Cyper 50, a Web 8000, a Web Supervisor using this Honeywell driver. 
So if you have an Excel, if you have a, a Cypher 50, there is no cost to integrating your your device. Well, there's no cost for hardware to integrate to the um, Excel 5000s, and there's no driver cost. But you still have your typical um, field device and field point costs for your licensing. So that part hasn't changed any. But the, the bigger cost is this, this driver. Uh, one thing to note is it's supported on webs 4.4 or above. And there's a list here of some uh, required firmware <laughs> versions. Now I have a BNA uh, on my bench and I'm using the older, I think it's 2.0.2 .2 is the firmware and I'm able to bring the devices in, in but it seems to be working fine. But these are the supported uh, uh, firmware versions that uh, that are to be should be used. Frank. Yes. To be clear, uh, if I have a Cypher 50, I still need a gateway, a cliff gateway? If you have a BNA, you don't. No, no. If I have a Cypher 50, can I not bring the C bus directly into the one of the 485 no. ports on the Cypher 50? You need the cliff device. So you have to have that either yeah, way. Yeah, that's the only way to bring in a 485 bus is either with the cliff or with the BNA. The 485 mm -hmm. ports on a Jace and on a Cypher 50 will not work. I see. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that up. That's something I should definitely have as a, uh, a bullet point on there, but that is what's required. Some of the features, I know a lot of people out there, we've been using the MaxLine CBUS driver for years and it's been working quite well, but you'll see in this list of features that this goes a lot further than what the MaxLine driver does. Uh, it provides access to the parameter files. So if you need to go in and tune your PID loop or on your, uh, your application, it's typically the parameter files that you'd have to find and go into to make changes. You would need care to do that if you were using, let's say, the MaxLine driver. But with this, with the Cliff device and the, and the CBUS driver by Honeywell, uh, the parameter files are accessed directly through the JACE, through the Cliff. You can get to the controller schedules. So you don't, you're not tied to having to use Niagara schedule and then overriding the point in the controller to do the scheduling. You can actually work directly with the time schedule in your XL 5000 controllers. And the scheduling views are available on HTML5. So you're able to um, use those views directly from your graphics from, you know, from a browser. Uh, you have access to the data, the, the Excel 5000 data point sensor offsets, the alarm settings, trend settings, all those pieces that were part of that Excel 5000 uh, controller. Um, the data point descriptor views, if you use descriptors in your data points in care for your controllers, they show up in here as well. Um, it comes with three alarm classes built in, system alarm, critical alarm, and non-critical alarm. And then basically what you're going to do is assign them to Niagara alarm classes. You can name them the same, have them all want, go to one class. It's up to you on that part of it. Um, and then also the, the, the more important part is we still have, we have access to the data point monitoring, the set commands and data point overrides. So when you go and you do an override on a point from Niagara on the CBUS side, you got your manual mode that it would go into. So your manual, manual and auto are directly affected by your overrides from the Niagara side. And your set command is a standard set. So if you're doing set points, you can still use a set command. You don't have to go into override. Physical IO can be overridden uh, with this as well. So in my case here, I have an XL 500 with no IO modules. So all my IO are uh, in fault, but I can still go in there and physically override them so the program has something to work with. I did a, um, a sine wave to my outside air temperature uh, in, in Niagara, and it is being used that way within the XL 500. So all that does work. Um, when that data points are in manual from an XI 582, they'll show up in Niagara as level eight overridden. Um, in previous drivers, if you put a point in manual from the CBUS side from say your XI 582, there was no way to um, take them out of manual from the Niagara side. You had to go back on the CBUS side with the XL 582, your laptop, whatever, um, to take it out of manual. And that's, that's correct 
right, Greg? That was something that was always an issue. Somebody went in there and did that, and we, we were stuck. We didn't have any remote control at that point. Let's see. And then the auto action Niagara on data points. We'll change it from manual to auto. As I said, it's something that, uh, it, that this driver will do. And here's just a quick little overview, architectural view of what we're talking about with, with this driver and with the cliff device. The scenario here is we have an existing legacy CBUS RS-485 network, and we're also showing a virtual CBUS over LAN. Uh, so on the 485 part, um, and here you'll see we got XL500, XL50, and XL100, and XL800. You're going back to the Cliff first 485 port. The Cliff device then transmits over the Ethernet LAN to the driver in the Cypher 50, and the Cypher 50 then can bring in all that CBUS data. The other is if you've got a flat LAN architecture with CBUS over LAN, uh, you add the LAN, the um, IF LAN2 adapter to that USB port on the cliff, and you can bring those points in that way. That was one of the big changes with this driver versus previous ones we've used is the CBUS over LAN. They were the newer XL5000 systems were, were, were uh, being used that way. It's the real old ones that have been the 485. There's probably still a lot more of the 485 ones out there than, than the virtual LAN, but you have the ability to work both ways with that. Now, if you had a BNA, the difference would be um, you'd have instead of the clip device, you'd have a BNA adapter in its place, and you're bringing in that CBUS back to the Cyber 50 through the CBUS driver. Just an overview of the uh, hardware, and actually the um, the browser view of the Cliff device. When you go in there to do setup, this is one of the options. So it comes up with this page and shows you all of these and what the um, what each piece is for. And as we look at this, you've got a uh, RJ45 on the side um, that is a RS232. That's factory debugging, so we're not really using that at all. Um, the second port, uh, there's a um, USB port on the side. That's for the, uh, the LAN bus connection to be able to do CBUS over LAN. Um, the Ethernet connection, RJ45 on the side, that's to get it on the network to be able to talk back to your, uh, in my case on this, on the bench here, I'm using the Cyper 50, but if you had the driver in a Web 8000 or a supervisor, you'd be able to pull that in. Um, you have your uh, bus termination resistance with the switch here uh, in this position. Uh, it's always set to mid. That's just what is needed um, for this device to work. Then we have the uh, first 485 port and that is what we want to use for our CBUS communications for the 485. The second port we're not going to use at all. Uh, there's a front HMI jack there. It looks like an RG45, but that's not used either. Um, and you'll see you have your uh, transmit and receive CBUS LEDs on there, power and status. And then you have a uh, USB port on the front. This is exactly the same use that you had on the Cyper 50, where you could take a um, USB cable from your laptop to there, and you set up a virtual Ethernet port on your laptop, and you can go directly into that device and do all the setup from there. Um, it has a set fixed uh, IP address that you can't change, so you really can't go wrong with connecting from there uh, to, uh, to do the setup. So when you're working with this, one of the first things you have, well, the first thing you have to do is connect and actually do the, um, uh, the setup of your device. In my case here, let me just look and see. I have, I do have it connected. So I'm connected to the front of it. So we should be able to connect here and pull up. All right, we did. So now I can do, so we're actually on the, uh, that front USB port and tied directly to the cliff device. And you'll see that, you know, you log in and then it gives you the status of the device. And you have the choice of configuration, firmware, or reload. So when we first go in, we're gonna to wanna to make sure we have the latest firmware. So you're gonna click on firmware. 
then you're going to choose the file, uh, the, the, the updated firmware file. It's, a, it's an XWA file extension. And it takes about four minutes for the firmware upgrade to, uh, to finish. Uh, it does come up and says that uh, this may take some time. Please re reload after two minutes. I found it to be about four minutes for it to, uh, to do. And went through, and we have this up on BP Tech Center as well, the, uh, the, this firmware. So that takes care of the firmware. Now we're up to date. Uh, so you log back in. You're going to click on your configuration button. And from there, it shows you the status of the device and its settings. So if we go in under configuration, you have your IP address, your subnet mask, your default gateway, uh, all that information. There's a port number. And this port number that's used, you don't want to change that. You want to keep it at 2499 because that's the same port number that's being used on the CBUS driver in your uh, Niagara device, in your Cypher 50. So you don't want to change that at all. I mean, if there was really a need to make... Sorry? Nothing go. The, um, if you needed to make a change to that, it has to be a value of over 1,024 in order for it to work. So if you change this port, you have to change it on both sides, on the on the driver side in the Cyper 50 as well as in the uh, Cliff device. And you'll see here if you had line over CBUS, this is where you're setting up your line information uh, to be able to talk to the uh, that IF line two device. Then once you're done configuring, if you click on that connection. Tab. Like if we come over here, we go to configuration. We can come down here and say connection diagram, and there's the diagram showing you, reminding you of what how everything is set up on, you know, what each port's for on the uh, on that device. It's 24 volts AC or. Let me see. I got. Just wanted to verify whether it was. You know, I've got. I'm using 24 DC on mine, so it's 24 volts AC or DC for the uh, for the power. So then I can go back from there, and you would save your configuration. So now, that's all there is. It really is. You're just setting up your your. Um, uh, your Ethernet settings is really the only thing that you're you're setting up in that box, so it's real simple on the the Cliff Gateway. On the uh, CBA, on the uh, Niagara side, it's actually even easier. Um, again, Niagara 4.4 or higher. Um, there is a CLC bus pallet that you're going to open, and you're going to drop your C bus network onto the uh, drivers folder, and then. The only thing you need to do is under BNA IP address slot, there's an IP address. That's the IP address of your Cliff device. You put that in there, you can give it a name, and you would also want to make sure that since we're only using channel one on the Cliff device, you want to make sure you set the baud rate correctly and then also the controller number. You can have up to 30, so you want to pick an unused number that's on the bus. On well, my setup here, I have my Cliff device set for 30, and I actually have a BNA on here set up as 29. So I actually have both on the on the network and, and they're functioning. Um, so that's really the setup is setting up its address, the IP address to the Cliff, and then your CBUS setting. And then you would save that. Then from there, what you're going to be doing is obviously we'll do a discover. So it's like any of the other um, drivers. Um, you have a discovery feature. It'll go out, discover your CBUS devices, and in my case, I have one XL500. And once discovered, you would say add CBUS controller and then click OK. And then what's going to happen is on that uh, device manager, uh, the controller status, communication status, and uh, this file loading column, there, that's where you want to look. When you add your device, you're going to see that it's going to go through and it'll be in progress. It's going to load the engineering units, analog and digital engineering units for the controller, the alarm text, the schedules. It actually will go through and load the IO characteristics as well and parameters. So it goes through all that. Once it loads all that information in for the controller, 
it'll come back and say controller status okay, communication status idle, file loading completed. Once it's completed, now you can go in there and um, start working with the points and bringing your points in. So when that controller is added, you'll see it comes up with the controller name, uh, what the program name is of what it was given in care, uh, what the firmware version is of that XL5000 device. And then you have your, obviously your points folder. There's a scheduling slot here that's gonna be your, your CBUS schedules that are in the controller. Then you have uh, three slots of for configuration so you can assign your alarm class to these alarms that are that exist on a CBUS device and then your parameters. So if we go in and we look at those, um, you know, we go back to alarm service and our normal services on a on a uh, station. Um, we I added system alarms, critical alarms, and non-critical alarm 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 classes to match what comes across from CBUS. So on the right here, you're going to see those slots that are part of each CBUS controller. So if you expand these, if you expand sys alarms, critical alarms, and non-critical alarms, you'll see there's an alarm class slot. That's where you select which alarm class in your alarm service you want to uh, have those alarms route to. Uh, so in my example here, I have each routing to an alarm class that's assigned for it, and then I actually have a separate console I created called CBUS console, so you can see those, point, those points separately. And you'll see when those alarms come in, there are alarm text messages that come along with those. Um, and those that, you know, I know Larry, Greg, you guys have done enough CBUS over the years. You've seen the B port change messages, points and manuals, all those messages come through like you would have seen on your um, XI-582, where you have to hit the C to, to clear out of it to go back in to, to work. In my case here, you're gonna have a bunch of alarms because of I don't have the I.O. boards. I just have a CPU and a power supply and nothing more. One of the big benefits of using this driver is you have your schedule view. And if you're familiar enough, and I know online here we are, um, it's this is CBUS scheduling. So you, you in, in care, you're creating a schedule. Then you have daily schedules. And in the case here of my controller that I have, I've got a schedule called normal weekday and another one that's 24 seven occupied. Um, so you get all the views that you would have on the CBUS side uh, on an existing system. Then you also have those views in HTML5. So you can use your browser, which means you can embed these in your PX um, graphics uh, in the station so that you don't need to use Niagara scheduling, you could just strictly use the XL5000 scheduling. If you'd rather use Niagara scheduling, you could just use Niagara schedule and do a link to whatever the output point is that this uh, CBUS schedule is hitting. And you're just gonna override it and the commands are gonna come directly from Niagara rather than from the time schedule. And then I just have some uh, point views that will show live, but um, these uh, data point views actually give you uh, CBUS information that you normally wouldn't get, uh, bringing it back through Niagara. Um, it'll come through, you have a, an alarming tab of inf information, and then you have other properties. So you got your alarm levels here. Then you have, under other properties, you have, it gives you a technical address of the point, uh, what type of point it is, what the IO characteristics are, you can change the trend log information, and this is trending that's within the controller that would show up on a display that's with the controller, not back in Niagara. And your sensor offsets are shown here as well from this view. And then there's an analog output and then digital out. And there's a scheduling point, but all those views are available. And they're available within Niagara and also from a browser. Uh, the other piece that's nice to have, and these don't get used that often, these are more used, I guess, when you're doing your commissioning of, uh, of a um, CBUS device, but you have access to the full parameters uh, that were created uh, when CARE was, its files were translated and downloaded to the controller. You have full access to those and you can change those values from through this driver. So with that, I will go back 
and show you in Niagara. I guess before I go any further, any any questions, Larry? Anybody? I'm good. Okay. So if we look at the uh, property sheet of the CBUS network, this is where I was saying you have the the the, the uh, BNA IP address. That's where you put in the IP address of your your Cliff device. Um, channel one is the channel that the CBUS is on. In our case here, controller number 30, CBUS baud rate 9600. So that's all good there. If we double click on the network, it'll then bring up the device manager for the CBUS. And like any of the other drivers, you have the discovery. And you'll see it actually did find my BNA, but I'm not going to even try to bring that in. But we have our XL 500 here, and you'll see the extensions where we got our three alarm types of alarms. We got points, we got schedules. So I could go in here and go to points. And you'll see these are all in fault because I don't have IO modules, so they're going to show in fault. The OA temp isn't showing in fault because I have a, uh, a link to a uh, sine wave generator and I rebooted the controller so it thinks that it's there because it's seeing a value change all the time. Um, but you'll see all the points are there. I can click on a point. Actually, if I do it from over here, if you click on a point, it'll bring up that data point view. So this is the view of all the information within that point in the controller. And you have your alarm limits, alarm hysteresis, um, your sensor offsets. If you're doing trending within the controller, you can change that there. Here's your manual auto operation. This is really sort of like looking at it from an XI-582 and changing values there. You don't need to use this view to make this change. I could come up here and do a normal override and say, okay, it's really, you know, I'm going to make it 68 degrees. And it'll go and make that change. I could go in here and say, go back to auto, and you'll see it goes back to auto and it goes back to what the auto value was, which is zero because the point's in fault because I don't have that analog input card in the controller. If we go back up here, you'll see the slot for schedules. And here, we could go in, you'll see we have one schedule. It's this uh, HV13, and then it's an overview of it. Then you have your daily schedules, and there's a 24-7 schedule, as well as a normal weekday schedule. So you can change that schedule there. And then there you get assigned to a weekly schedule. So here's your Monday through Friday, Saturday and Sunday, and you'll see Monday through Friday, we're using a normal weekday uh, schedule, and Saturday and Sunday, we're using 24-7 occupied. So if I wanted to, I could change this one to that. Hit save and it's made the change back in the controller. So if the controller lost connection to the Cypher 50 or to the Cliff device, the schedule's working in the controller as if, you know, you made the change from an XI-582. So it's a full scheduling of uh, CBUS scheduling that they've uh, brought through to Niagara. Then I mentioned we have the uh, SIS alarms, critical and non-critical. This is where you're going to go in and choose what alarm class you want to use for those alarms. Uh, and then so that if I go back here to services and I look at my alarm service, I created those three and then I have a separate console and you can see the alarms in here. And you'll see I got missing boards alarms for most of these because obviously they're missing. Parameters, you can go in and make changes. Now you need the care data really to know which, what each of the descript, which each of what each of these parameters uh, are for uh, to be able to know which one you'd have to change. If you got a PID to change on a specific PID loop in in the application, um, these are the parameters uh, and where you would make those changes. But you need that uh, information from care to know what to change, but they're available. This way you wouldn't have to go all the way back out to the controller with XI-582 and go in there and make those changes in the controller. You're able to do it right through um, through the uh, Cyber 50. Now, as I mentioned, I've got a BNA on here as well. 
So if we, I, what I did was I just came in here and said, I dropped another CBUS network on my drivers and I called it CBUS network BNA. So if I go there, actually I should just go to the uh, property sheet. I've got the IP address of the BNA in here. So it's 144 and I called it uh, CBUS controller number 29. So now that I have that on my network, I can go ahead and discover these devices. So in these devices is actually one XL 500 and that's what should come up. So there's my 500. So I'll go ahead and drop that on the network. And I'll just call it controller six. Get through here. And now you'll watch over here you'll see the, the uh, file loading in progress. It's loading point descriptors. So it's actually going into the controller and it's, it's pulling out of the controller all of the CBUS information. So point descriptors is first, then I think it's doing the um, analog descriptors next. Now I noticed it seems like on the BNA, it takes a little bit longer to go through and upload all this information than, uh, than I've seen on the, uh, the Cliff device. But while this is going on, I still have my Cliff device out there still talking. You wouldn't normally have two integration boxes on this side, two gateways on the same network, but uh, it doesn't have any problems. It's letting me, it lets me do this. So it's slowly going through. Um, while, it's, while this is in progress, any, any comments, any questions? Okay, you can see loading analog engineering units, then it'll do the digital engineering units. Uh, I guess while that's going on, we can come back. Okay, loading characteristics. While it's going through, we can come back over here and go back into, let me see if I'm, I may have to log in again. I was going to log into the uh, uh, the Cypher 50 from the browser so we can look at some of the views from there. So, Frank, with the parameters, you still need the uh, the secret the care, decoder ring, the secret decoder ring to figure out which parameter goes with which. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, it's still you know shot in the dark on guessing which one it is. So if we go through here and I just work our way down to that network, you know, if I look at schedules, and this again is a browser, you get the full view of everything and you can access those from there. Same thing with points. You know, we can go in here and you have the data point view from here as well. back over here see where we are okay we're in parameters now again this is just going to do this once once everything's pulled in then we have back then we can start playing around with points and whatnot so if we go back here we have schedules like i said we had parameters Not sure why every time I go to parameters, it seems like the first time in it, I get that error. The second time in it reads it fine. Okay, we're loading schedules now. I guess I shouldn't be hammering the, the network like this. The, there we go. Okay, so now the file loading is complete. So now we've got the controller brought into uh, Niagara. So now from here, and again, we're on the BNA side, so if we look here, we have no points. Um, so if I come in, and I've got, this is a 100-point license, so it's the standard license that comes with it, and I'm using 60-some. Um, Actually, we can check real quick. If you're ever wondering how close you are on your um, global points, global devices, if you go to SPY, go to SPY and then go to metrics, 
you'll see here I got six devices in my license. I'm using four. Um, 100 points, I'm using 62. So I got 38 points left that I can bring in. So if we go back down to the BNA, go to its points folder, I can do a discover. Let's go out and see what's there. It's a good size application that I've got in this 500, so it takes a little bit for it to find everything. Yes, I'm not sure what's going on with the parameters there. Take it out of there and go back. One of the nicest things I noticed about this um, driver is, is the they really fixed the auto manual condition of the C bus point. Correct. And that's 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 pretty that's pretty big. Yeah, because the previous drivers have been problematic with certain points being put in manual, depending on how you bound them, et cetera. Correct. Yeah, that definitely is. It makes a big difference. Uh, because you don't want to get stuck having to run out to the controller because somebody put it in manual out there and they forgot to put it back to auto. Or somebody wrote to a, an NVI point without it being bound. Right. So in the, my XL 500, I've got 205 points. Uh, in the application. So I'm just going to pull in a couple of points, a few points. Um, I wanted to get, let's see, where's the other one? Actual. They all come in as numerics. No. Nah. Not all of them. Where is the... That's the other one I wanted. So I'll bring in these points. And you'll see as the outside air temperature, I mean, if I go back up here, I've got, a, I've got my outside air temperature C bus point getting hit by a link to a sine wave. So the outside air temperature is changing. Um, so you'll see here, you won't see it change on the physical, on the point we brought in, because the hardware, hardware I.O. is missing, this, up, this value will not update. If we were to go in and look at the data point view, it's looking inside the controller. It will, it will show the values correct there. But you'll notice back here, it does not show the changes and that's just I checked with web squad and uh, that's not that's because I don't have an IO board so it's not going to read the device um, point uh, information but it is actually changed in the controller so it's kind of confusing but it's working and the way I can show it's working is the outside air temperature as I said has that that sine wave on it and it's changing um, is the I say it's changing but it didn't make it it's not changing there um, You'll see here it's changing. So you'll see the I have a, a hot water uh, a heat exchanger system and I have LA reset and you'll see the uh, uh, the set point changing because the outside air temperature is changing. Or if I wanted to, I could come in here and override it and keep it a fixed value. So you have full access with the overrides. So that was bringing it in through a BNA and. And as you can see, it's pretty straightforward, easy to work with. And um, let's see if we go back to the views. We could come back in here and look at the. I you know, want to see what this point, what's up with this point here. We'll see this one. If you'll see there's a that descriptor came in with it, not just the, uh, not just the data point name, 
but also the descriptor that was assigned. And that's if descriptors are assigned. Depending on the programmer, you may or may not have descriptors. I typically, uh, and I used to do a lot of 5,000 programming, I used to put descriptors in for all the points that were, you know, points that I knew were going to be used in, uh, you know, day to day. So they come in and um, you can see, you know, that it's a, uh, you know, the engineering units degrees. We don't have any trending set up on it. Uh, there is no alarming. You can enable alarming within the device if you wanted. So you have all that access from there. Um, again, the schedules are in there so we can pull those up. And this is all through the BNA where we have the same thing up there on the, the cliff device as well. So I'm just showing two different ways of accessing XL 5000. Um, through the BNA or through the uh, the Cliff device. But uh, that is it in a nutshell. Um, uh, let's see if I go back and if there's anything more here. I do it. The, this document will be with the link for the, um, the video up on BP Tech Center. But I pulled together all of the the information I found helpful. Some of it's from Germany, from Central Line, and, and others is what um, Web Squad has out on uh, Building Storm. So all that is here, along with uh, Guy Zebrick's uh, frequently asked questions. It's underneath his uh, IP controllers document. Is some information on it as well. Uh, so there's uh, all the information to be able to pull up. But I think. I don't think there's anything else um, other than, like I said, you really going to want to you price this out and see, you know, what's the most cost effective approach. You know, you may have an existing Web 8000, so price it both ways. But keep in mind, you got to buy that Honeywell driver at that point. So that is everything I wanted to cover. Um, any questions or comments before we close this out? Thank you. You're welcome. OK, well, thank you for uh, your time. And um, I guess we'll see you next time around the next uh, edition of uh, Tech Tuesday. But uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. And I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Frank. <clears throat>